Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our WPI virtual information session. We are thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Um, we're looking forward to sharing with, with you some information about WPI. My name is Emily Bucco, and I'm one of the counselors that works here in the admissions office. Um, I've been in the office here for about five years, but I've been working in admissions for well over 15. So I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you today about WPI. Before we do get started, I wanna turn things over to my co-presenter and let her introduce herself as well. Great, thank you, Emily. So hi folks, my name is Lana. I am a senior at the time of recording this session uh, who is studying biomedical engineering with a concentration in biomaterials. I work in our admissions office, but I'm also a campus tour guide and I do a lot with music and theater. Awesome. She keeps herself very busy. <laughs> we are going to get today, we're going to spend probably the next 40, 45 minutes or so going through some information for you guys to give you a great uh, kind of overview of WPI and what we do here. And certainly one of the places that we are going to start is talking to you about the WPI plan. And this is something where, this is how we deliver our academics and our curriculum to our students that we believe is a little bit unique. Um, and I say we, but really Lana's gonna do the heavy lifting here and talking about what that plan looks like and what it entails. We will touch on campus resources and student life in this um, session as well. And of course, we're gonna finish the session up by talking about the admissions process and of course, financial aid, certainly very important areas. Just to get started here, WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, um, we have been around for quite some time. We're really excited about our history and certainly um, our future as well and where we're going. We're about 4,700 students undergraduates, so we are predominantly an undergraduate institution, but it's good to note that we have a population of graduate students and certainly PhD programs on campus as well, which is a wonderful thing. Hopefully at some point you'll get a chance to join us on campus for an actual tour to see um, uh, the buildings and the, and the actual campus as well. Um, in the meantime, we're going to share some information with you about WPI. So when students think about WPI, I think one of the first things that comes to mind for them is thinking about something in STEM, right? So maybe that means they're thinking about science or tech or engineering or mathematics, and that's great. These are certainly things that we do, that we have, that we do well here at WPI. But I also always like to make sure students know that beyond STEM, we're also a place where the humanities matter. And we actually have a really large humanities department here on campus because we want our students to pursue their passions in STEM, but also to have those outlets in the humanities and the arts. And Lana will talk more about what that looks like, but I always like to make sure that students know there's a place for both here at WPI. We have well over 50 different degree programs here at WPI. So if you're sitting here thinking about what you'd like to study, maybe you, for example, wanna pursue biology or something in our life sciences. Well, that's great. We've got nine varieties of biology that you'd be able to pursue um, or start thinking about. Maybe you were thinking about engineering, certainly very popular here on campus. We have over 14 varieties of engineering for you to choose from that range from chemical engineering to biomedical engineering to fire protection engineering to architectural engineering, civil and environmental engineering, the list goes on and on. Certainly outside of that, of course, we've got computer science programs like data science, mathematical sciences, actuarial math, um, business is very popular with our students as well. There's really a lot of choice for our students. And that's kind of a good takeaway here. We really want our students to explore. We want our students to feel like they can um, start with a couple of different things or interests and, and kind of explore from there and discover what they're thinking about. Maybe you're not 100% sure what you want to study when you get to WPI. 20% of our students um, who do enroll are undecided and that's completely okay. Even if a student indicates a major on a, an application, one thing I always like to make sure students know is that when you are admitted to WPI, you're admitted to WPI, not to a specific program. Any WPI student can pursue any WPI program. Um, we know students change their mind when they get here, so we won't make them commit to a major right off the bat. We really do want our students to explore. Now, one of the things that we do talk about here on campus is this idea of how much can we fit into four years for undergraduate students experience, right? This idea of more and four, and, and that's gonna look different for every student, right? So certainly you'll pick a major, but maybe you pick a second major, maybe you pick a minor or a concentration based on your own interests. Maybe you're interested in those um, four or five year BSMS options. We certainly have opportunities for our students to stay on and complete a master's program. 
We also have examples of students who've completed both a bachelor and a master's degree in a four-year time period. So that's a cool option for our students as well. Maybe you are interested in doing an internship or, or, or more than one. Um, maybe you want to do a co-op. Maybe you want to study abroad. We're going to talk to you about how it is possible to fit all of these different pieces into your experience here in four years, which is really exciting for our students. Now, one thing I do like to talk about as well on this slide is our retention rate. So um, there are certainly not a lot of families that ask about our retention rate and are always curious. Great question to ask as you visit schools. At WPI, our retention from the first to the second year hovers around 95%, which we're very proud of. Um, I believe there's a number of factors that feed into why that number is so high. I give a lot of credit to our new student orientation program where our students are definitely uh, welcomed into the community right off the bat with three individuals. They've got um, a resident advisor living with them in the residence halls. They've got um, a community advisor who's kind of that upperclassman mentor or orientation leader, kind of helping them guide their way like, how do I find my classes? How do I change my meal plan? How do I get involved? Um, and then the third person is really that academic advisor who's helping students navigate that course selection process. And so these three individuals, among many others, really help our students kind of get hooked into the community early on so that they kind of feel like they're hitting the ground running. It's a wonderful um, fit for our students. Um, also important to note, as I mentioned, about 4,700 students undergraduate. We do have about a 13 to one student to faculty ratio, which is great for our students to be aware of. I always like to point out that in any of the courses that our students are, are taking, all of that new course material will be taught by your faculty, right? We do have graduate assistants and teaching assistants they may help with a review session, but that new course material is always being faculty taught, which is a good thing to be aware of. Um, certainly lots of facilities and labs on campus that we'd love to show you if you are able to come out for a campus tour. But that said, what I wanna do next is turn things over to Lana to talk to you a little bit more about what this WPI plan looks like. Great, thank you, Emily. So I have the honor and privilege of describing what exactly this WPI plan is. And it's essentially our four-step approach to bringing up that next generation of STEM workers and students, of problem solvers and creative thinkers. It's pretty unique and it really sets us apart from other institutions as the name implies. And it's been around for about 50 years now, so you know it's pretty tried and true. <laughs> All right, so the first part of the WPI plan that I'm going to highlight today is our unique academic calendar. As you start to look at other schools and other institutions, you'll probably run that they typically notice on a two uh, that they print. You'll probably notice that they typically run on a two semester system, um, and so in one academic year, you'll encounter two 14 week long terms. Here at WPI, we've decided and said to run on quarters. So in one year, you'll encounter four seven week long terms. During each term, you're only expected to complete three courses. So that means you only have three homework assignments or three quizzes or three exams or three projects to worry about. Nothing more than that. Uh, it's important to note that these courses are unabridged. So it's still that 14 weeks worth of information in half of that time. Initially, that sounds pretty scary, uh, speaking from experience, but it's really not as bad as it sounds, as our classes will meet pretty much every single day across a lecture period where you're learning new materials, a lab period where you're putting that content to use, or a conference section where you're meeting in smaller groups led by an actual member of your teaching staff who can help answer any difficult questions you might have, or to help you with problems in the homework, or of course, to prepare for your exams or quizzes. As for how this all shakes out calendar wise, you'll see that we start our year in a term and that will run from late August through mid October. We get about 10 days of break before we come back for B term, which runs late October through mid December. But another month off for that winter break, pretty traditional. We'll come back for C term, which runs mid January through early March. About 10 days off for spring break before we finish out the year strong in D term and that'll run mid March through early May. There's a couple things I want to highlight about this actual schedule, number one being that all of those between term breaks are true breaks for our students. So what do I mean by that? Well, when it comes to your courses, they can only run for seven weeks at a time. So that means you don't have to worry about any take home exams over break or any pre class homework assignments at, the, at that time as well. So those 10 days you have off or even that whole month is meant solely for you, the student, to best prepare yourself and recharge for those next uh, seven weeks. 
You'll also notice that we have a pretty long summer here at WPI that spans about four months on average. And there's a couple of things that our students like to do to take advantage of that time off. The first thing I'm gonna highlight is that optional E-term, which runs June through July. If you really love the concept of having a double major or picking up a minor or pursuing a BSMS program in four, four and a half or five years, this can be a really great way to fit in some extra courses without necessarily having to tack on an additional calendar year to your degree. What I'd say is more common to pursue during this time off though is actual work opportunities, which typically comes in the form of an internship this is a full-time position that can start and finish in the span of one summer. And during that time, you'll be getting all of that valuable work experience. You'll probably be getting paid for it. And the other really amazing thing is you get to make some great industry connections for you to call back upon in the future. The other option for a work opportunity is a co-op. And I will say it's a little less popular with our students just because it is a longer term role where you will have to take a little bit of time off from school to actually start and finish that. That being said, if you're really passionate about feeding that experience, there's a couple different tools you can use to make sure you can do that and still graduate in four years if that's something you know you wanna do. That being said, internships and co-ops are completely optional at WPI. Most students just choose for themselves to go pursue that, but by no means do you have to. The second part of the WPI plan I'm going to discuss is our non-punitive grading policy. So as an undergraduate student, you can receive one of four overall course grades, and that can be an A, B, C, or an NR, which is short for no record. Before I discuss that last one, since it's pretty specific to our institution, I wanna take a moment to point out that we do not offer pluses and minuses here at WPI. We only have straight letter grades. This was an intentional move on our part for a couple different reasons, but number one, we feel it leads to a happier and healthier student, as you're not gonna be in a competitive environment 24 seven. It's gonna be a little bit more collaborative because of this. Also thinking ahead to the workforce, you're never gonna have an instance where you have to outcompete your colleagues 24 seven. So we feel pretty strongly that that's not how you're learning here at WPI. As for that NR or that no record, if you're scoring below a C in a class, you're probably not gonna retain that information in a way that's going to benefit you in the long run. We don't wanna punish you for that or hold that against you. So instead of awarding a D or an F, you receive this no record. What this means for a student is that there is no record of you ever taking this course. So it doesn't show up in your transcript and it does not wait into your GPA. It's like nothing ever happened. This is really just a safety net for our students in case they have an off term for personal reasons or a course just really is not what they were expecting it to be. And it serves as a gentle reminder to either retake this course in the future when you feel better equipped to do so or to find something else to satisfy that same requirement. And this ties into the third part of the WPI plan, and that is our flexible curriculum. Doing some quick math, if you're taking three classes a term for about four years with us, you're probably gonna complete about 48 courses on WPI campus. Now, any of you can go online and look up the WPI undergraduate program tracking sheets and see what, what is required of a student on a major by major basis with an actual breakdown of what courses you need. That being said, there's really only 45 slots on most of those papers. So what happens to those other three? Well, if you receive an NR, no worries, you're not gonna fall behind. You technically have three of them built into your schedule. And the other thing you can do with that is to put it aside for your more and more experience. So if that means doing that co-op, that's already a whole term set aside for you. If you wanna go and just take random classes, you can do that, or you can count them towards those double majors, minors, concentrations, whatever you need it to be. You'll notice on that same sheet of paper that it's pretty much blank. We aren't assigning our students pre-prescribed schedules. When you come to campus, you're pretty much going to be told, hey, these are certain courses you have to take, but we're not going to tell you what will satisfy these requirements. It's up to you to decide. For me as a biomedical engineering major, I had to take six math courses, two chemistries, two physics, two biologies, amongst a bunch of other things, of course. But I was able to choose for myself what I wanted to take so I could tailor my schedule to my own interests and what I thought would benefit me with my future career plans. As someone who's really into pharmaceuticals and drug delivery systems, I thought that organic chemistry would be a really great choice for me. So instead of retaking the general chemistry sequence here, which I took back in high school, I instead decided to hop into organic chemistry as a first year student. 
That was a bit of an interesting decision on, on my part, but it did work out in the end. So I do firmly stand by that sentiment. Um, but the really cool thing about this is that it's made possible by the fact that we don't have prerequisites on WPI campus. We only have what are called recommended backgrounds. Obviously, if you are looking to take Calculus 4 as your first ever math class with us, we would strongly recommend that you have know, Calculus is 1 through 3 already under your belt, academically speaking. But if you do a lot of math in your free time, or you just think Khan Academy is a really cool way to pass your time, you're more than welcome to jump into an upper level course. And that is true of all of the disciplines we have here on campus. For more computer science oriented students, if you already know how to code in Java, you don't have to take an introductory Java course. The last thing I'm going to highlight in regards to that flexible curriculum, though, is to just briefly touch upon our advanced credits here at WPI. In case you're taking an AP course or an IB course, we accept fours and fives on the AP exam or sixes and sevens on the higher level international baccalaureate. And you can find all of the details for that on our website. So this right here is the fourth and final part of the WPI plan. I'm a little biased in saying that this is my favorite part, but I'd say that most students on WPI campus really love this aspect the most when it comes to learning as a student here. You'll notice that we only have four projects listed on this slide, but it's important to know that you encounter projects and hands-on learning from day one in the classroom. These are just sort of our four favorites to highlight, but you'll encounter plenty more during your time here. Of these projects listed, only one is optional, and I'll start by describing that, which is our Great Problems Seminar, or our GPS. This is a chance for first-year students to learn what it means to work on a college-level project on our campus. Maybe back in high school, you didn't have the chance to work in teams, or to conduct research, or to learn how to present, but you really want to pick up those skills almost immediately on campus. This could be a really great course for you. You'll be working on more social science-based issues or more humanitarian-based issues. One example of this comes from our course called Heal the World. We had a group of first-year students who examined sub-Saharan African plants and then derived a hand sanitizer using those ingredients. This was a really ingenious solution as it helped with hygiene and sanitation within those communities, but it also encouraged them to take a more local and sustainable approach. The next thing I'm going to discuss is the humanities and arts on campus. You already heard Emily allude to this a little bit, but just in case you forgot, um, we do have a brief requirement of what uh, of courses for the humanities and arts here on campus, but if you're someone who dreads taking an English class, I'm quite happy to report you don't have to take an English course if you don't want to. I am graduating, and I still have yet to write a single English paper in my time here. I've obviously written my fair share of lab reports, but I find that to be a little bit easier for my brain and the way it's wired. Uh, the Humanities and Arts is the largest department on campus, so when it comes to this requirement, you have a whole lot to choose from as, as to what you can do. So during your time here, you'll take three courses in what's called your depth. So something that you know you enjoy doing, something you know you want to dedicate three courses to. You'll then take two in what's called your breadth. And this can be something that you're really excited about and interested in, but maybe you haven't had the chance to explore before. After you complete those five courses, you'll then take a sixth one, which is actually going to be your final project. And this can be a capstone where you spend seven weeks creating something or an inquiry seminar where you spend seven weeks researching something. For me, I've been a musician since I was about eight years old, so it felt pretty natural to continue that here at the BPI. And so after I completed my courses, I worked with a faculty member here on campus to arrange a medley of music from the Avatar The Last Airbender show. And that was able to be performed by a string quartet and two percussionists. This was a really cool experience because I didn't think that as a sophomore biomedical engineering major, my school would present me with the opportunity to hear my own music rehearsed live in front of me. But that's one of many things that I've been able to do here. And it's really cool to think about the fact that it came from an actual requirement. So this can really be what you want to make out of it. The next project I'm going to discuss is the IQP or the Interactive Qualifying Project. This is typically completed in your junior year, so usually your third year with us, and it's a chance for you to work in interdisciplinary teams. We here at WPI find this project really important because it gives you the chance to see just how interdisciplinary STEM is. You're going to learn how your more specialized and technical skill set can be used in other areas of work that you might not necessarily be considered an expert in to start. And then while you're doing that, you're also preparing for the workforce because you're never going to be on a team of just biochemists 
or I don't know, just robotics engineers. We want you to learn how to communicate with people from other disciplines while also understanding their same thought processes. So this can be really important for you. This is similar to the GPS and the fact that it's going to be a social science problem or another humanitarian based issue to solve. For me, my junior year, I worked with a nonprofit organization in Hangzhou, China to research support groups here in the US to then figure out how we could convert that into an online model to help with mental health and well being in China. Once again, I'm not a psychologist and I'm definitely not a computer scientist. In fact, I personally cannot code to save my life. But it was really cool seeing how much of my skill set already overlapped with what was needed to accomplish this project. The last project I'm going to discuss today is the MQP or the major qualifying project. I'm a little biased in saying that this is my favorite just because I did actually complete this project very recently. And it's our senior year capstone research project at the BPI. I always say that it's your last chance to wrap up all of your learning with a pretty little bow, which enables you as a senior to approach employers and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. This is a problem I saw in my field. This is how I wanted to fix it. This is how I fixed it. And here's the final product. For me as a biomedical engineering major, it is my duty to create really amazing devices and technologies to improve the lives of patients. But it's also my duty to make sure that those same things I create are accessible and able to be used by those who need them most. And so if that means making it less invasive, less scary, or also just less expensive, I am all for that. So I worked on a team of biochemists and biomedical engineers to develop a non-invasive diagnostic testing kit for endometriosis. In case you don't know, endometriosis is when the lining of the uterus grows in places it shouldn't. It's extremely debilitating and notoriously difficult to diagnose. As of right now, the only commonly available methods for diagnosing endometriosis are really invasive, expensive, and also very subjective in nature. So my team wanted to take a lot of question marks out of that process for folks. So we created something similar to a pregnancy test where we can take a sample of urine, analyze it for certain chemicals, and then spit out an actual result after just a couple minutes or sometimes hours. And so we're hoping that this device will be capable of cutting down the average diagnostic turnaround time for endometriosis of approximately 6.7 years to hopefully just one quick visit to the actual doctor's office. And so you as a senior here at WPI are able to make a lasting and meaningful change in your field while you're still an undergraduate student. So taking a step back, some of you probably heard me mention Hangzhou, China, and wondered how I made that connection and what I was doing with that group. And the answer is that this is our global projects program at work. When it comes to that IQP and MQP, or those junior and senior year project experiences, they're actually equivalent to three courses, so one whole term's worth of work. This means you, the student, can focus on just this project and not have to take any additional courses in one term, and then go to any of our 50 plus project centers that we have to offer across the globe. This is a really cool way for you to work with actual people and communities on issues that are actually affecting them. And so during your seven weeks abroad, not only are you going to be creating an actual solution, but implementing it. It's important to note that this is not your typical study abroad. We're not sending you to some other university and taking courses there that you take just fine on WPI campus. Instead, it's going to be more like a seven week long internship. Now, we here at WPI understand that picking a college can be an expensive decision to make and then adding a study abroad experience on top of that can really add to the price tag. But what we don't want is for money to be the final barrier between you and this really amazing experience. So one initiative that our president, Dr. Lori Leshen introduced is the Global Scholarship Program. This program guarantees up to $5,000 to help alleviate the costs associated with studying abroad. So if you're worried about airfare, no worries, we can cover you, uh, cover you there. If you do receive the full 5,000, it's typically more than enough to cover the cost of a site in its entirety for most of the sites that we have to offer. That all being said, I've been chatting uninterrupted for quite some time now. So Emily and I are just gonna show you folks a quick little video that sort of summarizes the WPI experience. What I found different from my high school was that at WPI, everyone is there because they love to learn. 
project opportunities are built into all four years of the WPI curriculum. My name is Marco Villar. I'm from San Diego, California, and I innovate building materials. What I would like to go into is finding alternative methods that make a building less harmful to the environment. I knew that with WPI's project-based curriculum, I'd be able to get that hands-on experience. You get the chance to apply what you learned in a classroom out onto the field. I'm Bree, and I innovate infant respiratory rate monitors. For biomedical engineering design class, you're presented with a problem. So ours was to create a device that will um, help prevent sudden infant death syndrome. It's so incredible to have something that I can look at and say, I did that. I created this in seven weeks. My name is Chelsea Ross Miller. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I innovate regenerative medicine. I've wanted to be a doctor since I was 13. It's one of those few things in my life that hasn't changed. So I didn't want to go to college where it was going to be back to Scantron tests. I wanted to go to a place where I could actually do something with what I was learning. You really have that opportunity all the time to be innovative and to apply your knowledge. And so it's important to me, you know, even getting my biology degree, to be working towards something that's going to be benefiting healthcare in the long run. My name is John, I'm from New Jersey, and I innovate robotics. Frankly, the whole robotics program itself is innovative. We think of robotics like a three-legged stool. There's one leg that's the mechanical engineering side, one leg that's the electrical and computer engineering side, and then one leg that's the computer science side. You become really well-rounded, and that's what companies love. I never really thought that I was gonna be building robots from day one in my robotics class, but it, I was. <laughs> In their junior year, students embark on the interactive project, what we call the IQP. About 90% of our students do their IQP off campus at locations all around the globe. I have been working in a community called Machini Mom. We are located in Cape Town, South Africa. Right now, I am standing in one of the community members' shacks. These shacks are amazing, but there's no light. They're all metal, so how is any light gonna get in, ever? We started sketching out some ideas, and I'm still blown away by the fact that a bottle of water, bleach, and just put it in a hole in your roof can allow so much light into a shack that you would be able to replace a 50-watt light bulb with this bottle of water. It's incredible. It's what the community really wanted, and it's a new and innovative way to do it. Welcome to Venice. This is the measuring stick that's used to measure the water level. These are actually devices that we made ourselves. The work here was really giving Venice a way to monitor their canals. And Venice's canals are like their roads. It's how they get around. It's how they transport things. IQPs will do that. They give these cities and these countries ways to like improve how they're doing things. The best thing about being a WPI student is that you're finally with a community of people that have the same passion and values that you do. They may not realize it, but they're changing the world as their college students. They don't have to wait until they're out of college to change the world. You honestly have the chance to make the change that you want to make. I'm going to try to improve my community, and eventually, who knows, I will change the world. We're no longer students, we're thinkers, we're researchers, and we're innovators pushing the world to become something different and something better. We innovate everything. 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 Right, so I always like showing that video because it's one thing hearing from Emily, who's a current counselor, one thing hearing from me, a current student, but an entirely different thing hearing from students who have already finished their time at WPI and can look back at that experience to figure out what really stood out to them. And just to summarize some of the points that made during that video, as well as what I've been trying to get at during this presentation today, we here at WPI love these projects for a couple different reasons. Number one, it allows us to take what we've learned in the classroom and then see what that means out in the real world. 
here at WPI, we're pretty big on theory and practice, as that is quite literally our motto. So we want to make sure that our students understand what things look like on paper, but that they also don't necessarily work off paper all the time. Number two, we get to build up different skills that you don't get from sitting in a classroom all day long. So from day one, we are building up our confidence, we are working on our teamwork, we're developing our presentation skills, and since you're working on a real project, you're probably going to pick up conflict resolution pretty quickly, as that's just the name of the game there. But finally, it's really cool working on these because we're able to sort of have relationships with companies and nonprofits and sometimes even government agencies. So as an undergraduate student, we're getting a really invaluable sneak peek into what's going to be expected from us when we go off and enter the workforce. That all being said, I'm going to now pass it back over to Emily. Great. Thank you, Lana. So yeah, that's a great cue up for our next slide here to talk to you about what our Career Development Center does here on our campus. So definitely they provide some fantastic resources for our students, but um, it's also a great question to ask as visiting families often do. So what happens? What do your students do when they graduate? So CDC does a couple of things. They host two large scale career fairs each year, one in the fall, one in the spring, where over 400 different companies are coming to campus to recruit WPI students. Now, one question I get quite frequently is what's the major, what's the program that's drawing these employers to campus to recruit students? And the answer I'll tell you is actually not a specific program, but really the WPI plan that Lana just described for you. These employers understand the term system. For example, they know if they have to turn something around in a six or seven week time frame ask a WPI student to work on it, they're used to those tight timelines. Um, they understand the project work. They know that at any given point, as Lana was saying, you could stop a WPI student and say, tell me about a time when you're working on a project and you hit an obstacle, you had to pivot, your outcome changed, something happened, right? How did you respond to it? What's great is these career fairs and these employers aren't just seeking our seniors, right? These are for all of our students, freshmen all the way on up. Some of our first year students are looking for summer internship opportunities, as Lana had explained earlier on. So this is a great place to start learning about what those opportunities might look like. And so lots of great resources for our students. One thing that they also do is um, they collab, they put together, they collect all this information from our graduating students. Every May, after our students graduate, six months later, uh, the CDC polls our students, undergraduates, graduates, and our PhD students to say, hey, where are you working or what higher degrees are you seeking? And what's really great is they put all this information together into a report, our career outcomes data, which you can find on our website. And then you can kind of scroll through to see, well, where have the graduates gone from certain classes? And it goes back usually four or five or six years. What's neat is the, the return on these uh, surveys is usually well over 90% for that knowledge rate of the students who've actually responded to us. So we really do know and have a grasp on where they are. Let's say, for example, Lana wanted to look up and see what some biomedical engineering students have done or gone on to work. And she can look up by major all the different employers where these students have pursued work and industry or if they're seeking higher degrees, where and what type of degree. So it's a great wealth of information, a wonderful rabbit hole to go down if you have a chance, but just a, a little snippet of, of all the wonderful work that our CDC does for our students. Now to switch gears a little bit, um, we'll touch on some campus life aspects as well. Good to know, certainly we are a residential campus. We have over 15 different residence halls and types of styles of residence halls for our students to live in. As a first year student, you are guaranteed housing for that first year, which is a wonderful thing. Not to say you can't stay on campus as a second or a second year or a junior or even into your senior year, you're welcome to do that if you would like. Um, that said, we do have a percentage of students that opt to move off campus. Um, we're located in a great section of Worcester that have, allows our students to have a lot of choice to live off campus. So that actually works out really well. There's a very nice balance there. Um, certainly dining facilities on campus, we've got plenty of those. And we do actually have a first generation community um, for our new first generation students to join if that's something that's of interest to you. But in terms of getting involved on campus, I'm actually gonna have Lana talk to you because she's, she's quite a busy student while she's been here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little busy. Um, so we do have a lot available for students to do in case you're a little bit more sports minded. We are an NCAA Division III school and we have 10 men's and 10 women's varsity sports teams. In case you don't want to play at that commitment level, no worries. We also have club and intramural sports. 
In case you don't know, club means you get to play against other schools in the area, while intramural is strictly WPI versus WPI. So sometimes in like a random volleyball tournament, you're on a team with some friends and you're matched up against a team of professors, in which case you really want to win not only for bragging rights, but also a free t-shirt. Um, however, admittedly, I don't have a single athletic bone in my body, um, so I'm a bit more leaning towards the clubs and organization side, where there's a lot for our students to do. We have all of your traditional offerings like Greek life, honor societies, um, cultural and religious groups, anything you can really think of there, all the way to some more niche offerings, including our two cheese clubs, one for making, one for tasting. Shout out to Gompi's Goat Cheese and the big goat cheese fan. Um, and I also love to give a special shout out to our Rubik's Cube Club. These students meet and just figure out ways to solve a Rubik's Cube as fast as possible. Um, I'm about to turn 21 and I still have yet to solve a single Rubik's Cube in my whole life experience. So the fact that these students do it in under a minute is very impressive to me. So if you can't tell when we say that there's something for everyone, we genuinely mean it. True statement. <laughs> Let's talk about Worcester for a moment before we jump into the admissions information. So obviously Worcester, it's in our name, it's where we are. I like this slide because hopefully it shows you kind of a great overview of where we are within the city of Worcester. So if you look at the center of the slide and you see all those brick buildings, that's main campus, right? That's where we are. You can see Worcester's blocks away downtown right behind us. So we really are in a residential section of Worcester, which allows our students to kind of have that traditional campus feel. Uh, there's no city street that cuts through our campus. However, we are literally blocks from downtown. So our students have great access to get into the city of Worcester, which by the way, second largest city in New England. And we share it with a number of area colleges. So you are always gonna be bumping into college students um, when you go out to eat, for example, if you go to the Worcester Art Museum, the Hanover Theater, the DCU Center, or Polar Park to cheer on the Worcester Red Sox. There's so much to do in the city, and I think our students really enjoy having that balance. If you ever have a chance to come up and visit, we are happy to make some lunch recommendations for you. So let's shift with the last few minutes we have here. Um, we want to just talk to you about some of the admissions information um, and just note that all of this information can be find, found on our website as well. Just start off with deadlines. It does look like we have quite a few, but really I'll break it down for you. We've got about three different deadlines. We just happen to have a couple of different rounds of decisions. So we are an early decision school. We also offer early action. We happen to offer two rounds of both of those and of course a regular decision option as well. Quick clarification, early decision is a binding agreement whereas early action is non-binding. So remember, if, let's say you love WPI and you think it's a strong academic fit, social fit, financial fit. If you get admitted to WPI, you are coming no matter what. Maybe early decision is a great option for you as it is a binding agreement. If you're admitted, you are joining our community, which is a wonderful thing. Maybe you like WPI and it does fit you academically, socially, or financially, but you want to have a little bit of choice. Maybe you want to hear back from all the other schools that you're going to get accepted to and have some time to kind of decide things over across compare school acceptances and decide by May 1. Well, that might be a better fit as an early action student, which of course is non-binding, okay? We just offer two rounds of both. Regular decision, it's important to note, is also a non-binding option. We do not have a preference, though that said, of the over 11,000 applications we do receive each year, certainly our applicants have a preference, and we do see most of our applications coming in, certainly at that early action round one, November 1st deadline, which is a good thing to know. We have a number of different options in hopes that you find one that fits best for you. In terms of the application process, I do want to just point out that we've got three things that we focus on. Certainly the common application, which if you're not familiar with that, is an application used by almost 1,300 uh, institutions across the country. The goal being you fill out one application that you can then submit to multiple schools. On the Common App, there is an essay component, which is a great way for us to hear your voice and hear your personality in your application. I always recommend to my juniors, write it over the summer, have it proofread, and make sure you know that it's just a great way for us to understand your personal context. So have fun with it. There's also room in the Common Application for you to tell us what you do outside of school, right? So we want to know, what does that look like for you? Maybe you work 25 hours a week and you don't have time to get involved. Or maybe you do do clubs, sports, organizations. Maybe you volunteer. Maybe you travel. Maybe you have family responsibility and you take care of an elderly grandparent or a younger sibling. Whatever that looks like for you, we just want to know. It helps us understand all the different things that you're balancing in your day-to-day. 
We're not interested in quantity of things that you do. We really are just interested in what is it that fills your day outside of school, where are your interests, where are your passions, and really getting a chance to learn more about who you are. We also are going to take a look at your high school transcript. An important thing to note here is we look at you within the context of your high school, okay? So what type of high school do you go to? Everyone goes to a different school, okay? So what, um, let's say you go to a high school that offers 36 AP courses and a full IB diploma program. Great, okay. Maybe you go to a high school that offers five honors classes. Because high schools are so different, understand that's why the context of you within your high school is very important. We wanna see how are you doing at your high school? Where are you challenging yourself? What types of classes are you taking? What do you have access to take given the context of your high school? And of course, how are you doing, okay? So that transcript really gives us your academic um, context. We're also gonna ask for two letters of recommendation, one from a school counselor and also one from a teacher, uh, a core academic teacher. We don't have a preference, you can pick. Um, I do always tell students, you're welcome to submit more than two. I probably wouldn't go north of three. I think that's great, but do remember we only require those two. Uh, WPI is in fact test blind. Uh, so that means we've eliminated the usage of a test score in our evaluation process. Quick history there in 2007, WPI became the first institution to go test optional, um, polytechnic institution, excuse me, to go test optional, giving the students the option to either submit or not submit their test scores. 14 years later, we collected a lot of data to see how our students were subsisting and graduating um, here at WPI to see if there were any significant differences. And after 14 years of data collection, we noticed that between our submitters and our non-submitters, there was no difference. Everybody was being equally successful here at WPI, so we were able to go ahead and get rid of it completely. We also don't have an application fee. If you'd like to apply to WPI, we would love to review your application. In terms of what we look for, it's just really good to know it is a holistic process. Certainly we spend time on the Common App, on your high school transcript, and on those letters of recommendation. Certainly we're looking for things like, Lana talked about group work. You're gonna do a lot of group work here. How collaborative are you? Are you interested in being a part of a team or solving these problems? Do you have kind of that curiosity to find a solution? Those are important things because you're gonna do a lot of that here. Lana talked about that flexibility in, in terms of picking and choosing your coursework. And, and we wanna make sure that that's something that you're interested in doing. Our students love the idea that they can really individualize or cater their schedule to their own interests, right? So we're looking for students that kind of have that interest. In terms of your courses, of course, we're not just going to spend time on senior year. We look at all four years of your high school transcript. Sure, we're going to emphasize a little bit of that math and science track, given the nature of who we are. That's not usually a surprise. But one thing I do like to highlight is that specifically in math, the lowest level math we offer at WPI is Calc 1. So we want to make sure our students are ready to jump in at Calc 1, if not higher, when they get here as a first year student. The best way to make sure you're ready for that is to have completed through pre-calculus by your senior year. Maybe you did pre-calc a sophomore, junior year, moved on to a calc or an AP calc class, you're fine. I just always like to make sure we point out that math minimum as well. Um, in terms of average rank in class, take that with a grain of salt. A lot of high schools don't follow, a, 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 don't have a class rank anymore. An average GPA right there, that's not based on weighted or unweighted. It's actually, we leave that off on purpose because every high school reports it to us differently. Ultimately, we use whatever your high school gives us. We don't recalculate GPAs, whether you give us an unweighted or a weighted or neither or commentary instead of grades. Basically, we want to see a lot of A's with some B's, but we also want to see the types of classes you're taking. Where are you challenging yourself? Okay, so really thinking about the balance between those two. And finally, just to talk about scholarships and financial aid, very important question that a lot of people are usually concerned with. 97% of our students receive some form of financial aid, whether it's um, need-based or merit-based or maybe a combination of both. On the merit side of things, the great news is that our students are automatically considered for merit-based aid just by being an applicant. So if you apply to WPI and you're admitted, if you were eligible for merit scholarship, it's gonna be right there in your acceptance letter. Any merit you receive, you get to keep for the four years that you're at WPI. Um, which is a wonderful thing. The one exception to that rule, if you happen to be a FIRST or VEX robotics student, remember they offer scholarships as well. There is a separate application that goes along with those scholarships, but outside of those robotics scholarships, 
all of that merit is an automatic consideration just by being an applicant. On the need-based side of things, we do ask for two forms, the FAFSA, which is that free application for federal student aid, and the CSS profile. Uh, the FAFSA, remember, will help us understand what types of federal money you might qualify for. The CSS profile, you're going to notice, not used by every school. Schools that do use it are sometimes trying to award other sources of aid outside of the federal government. But in order to do that, they just need to get a little bit more information from you. Both forms become available as of October 1st every year. My general recommendation is once you've decided on applying to a school and you've picked out an application deadline, use that as the same deadline to submit your financial aid paperwork if you're applying for financial aid. We're need blind here in the admissions office, so we're not concerned with what you, if you're applying for aid or not, we just wanna see if you can be successful at WPI. That said, if you are applying for aid, it would be great to get your uh, acceptance letter with the same time you get your financial aid package. And the best way to do that is to make sure you submit all those forms on time or at the same time, I should say. So that about does it for Alana and I. Um, we just wanna thank all of you for joining us today, for watching this video. Certainly if you have questions, we wanna make sure you are comfortable reaching out to the admissions office, give us a call, go to our website, send us an email. We are here to help answer your questions and we appreciate you taking the time today to spend some time with us learning more about WPI. Good luck in your college search and have a great afternoon, everyone. Yay! <laughs>